Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 FM, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Cherokee land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. This week I'm sharing a conversation with David Easley, an imprisoned member of the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee, or IWOC, currently held at Toledo Correctional in Ohio. But I want to say a few words about Sean Swain first. Sean Swain, an anarchist prisoner whose commentaries we regularly feature here and a friend of William and I, has talked about his participation in this radio and podcast endeavor as a way for him to squeeze through the bars and reach a wider audience, which is a point of pride for us here at TFSR. The human voice, even when reading a humorous and crass script, can convey so much. It can touch us so much more deeply than the written word. The reverberations emanating from the human body have shaped our sociality as humans since our time in the womb, reaching back to before when we were humans. Squeezing a person through the bars with a voice, breaking that confinement, those othering walls, even for a brief period, allows a circuit to connect between free animals and you, dear listener, me and the person in prison, with you, dear listener. You help complete the circuit. You're now in a relationship with the voices you're about to hear. I'll get back to Sean in just a few moments. So, in response to David Easley's organizing around the nationwide prison strike in 2018, he and a few other prisoners were thrown into segregation. They've had their mail tampered with and stolen. David has also been transferred between numerous facilities around the state as punishment, losing his personal items and his ability to communicate with the outside along the way. We were also joined on this phone call by Jasper, a supporter of David's and a participant in the Free Ohio Movement. For the hour, David and Jasper talk about the prison system, the challenges they've faced opposing it, and ways other folks can get involved in that work. You can write to David at the following address, David Easley, A3064400, Toledo Correctional Institution, 2001 East Central Avenue. Toledo, Ohio, 43608. You can also keep up with David via the Twitter account at OH4Prisoners and on Fedbook via the account david.easley.353 or you can contact him as he suggests a few times via JPay using his name and the number that I already listed, A306400. You can check out our show notes for more links and info. As a sort of warning, David, who identifies as living with mental illness, uses some terms that have fallen out of favor to describe neurodivergent folks, terms that are considered insulting by many. Check out the end of this podcast for a couple of announcements. The Final Star Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. Here's a jingle from another member of CCN. After the 2016 election, a lot of us woke up to some harsh realities. In the aftermath of dark events, I came back to political work with a new sense of urgency. But after a few months of showing up to protest every weekend, I started to burn out. It didn't feel like anything was changing. In fact, maybe things were even getting worse. And it got me thinking, what comes next? Rebel Steps is a podcast about what comes next. You'll hear episodes on letter writing to political prisoners, practicing mutual aid, and creating political art. You'll hear the voices and stories of my community in New York City, spotlighting a range of organizers from the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, NYC Books Through Bars, Anarchist Black Cross, Lower Manhattan Food Not Bombs, Brand Workers, and more. I'll walk you through what you can do to start plugging into movements and learning organizing skills step by step. If you've been to a march or two and you're looking to jump in, this podcast is for you. Or if you have friends looking for more, pass it on. Listen at rebelsteps.com on iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. I'd like to share an update. I found out a few days ago that Sean Swain has been interstate transferred from Ohio to Virginia. While it's nice to have him closer to the radio show, it's bound to be a very tumultuous move for Sean. Virginia has a different legal system in its prisons. Sean likely has none of the friends from his last 27 years inside the Ohio system present where he's at. He'll be facing a whole new set of challenges settling in. I don't know anything about the specifics of his transfer, but we hope to hear from him soon. So please consider writing him a letter at his new address and number at Sean Swain, number 2015638, Nottaway Correctional Center, P.O. Box 488, Burkeville, Virginia, 
23922. To read more of Sean's writings and keep up on his case, visit seanswain.org. So I'm speaking with David Easley, a prisoner from Ohio who's been repressed for participating in the 2018 nationwide prison strike, as well as a supporter of David, a person who's doing the support work and outside organizing. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jasper. Um, I'm affiliated with the Free Ohio Movement, and I've been in correspondence with David for almost a year. Yeah, almost a year. I know about the strike and a lot of the repression that's been happening. David, how did you get into politics and are you affiliated with any any prison organizations or what have you? Yes. First of all, I'm 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 incarcerated at the Maximum Security Prison in Toledo, Ohio. Uh Toledo, Ohio Correctional Facility. And uh, my name is David Easley. My number is three oh six four hundred. And you can reach out to me if you want to on jpay.com to send me emails direct. How I got involved with politics, uh, you know, uh, back in the early, early 90s, uh, two correctional officers had handcuffed me at Lucasville behind my back. And they beat me real bad and split my eye. And uh, they had knocked my eye out the so- out my socket busted my lip open and threw me down some steps and there was blood everywhere and all the prisoners was yelling and they was going off trying to get medical and the nurse and get me medical attention and then uh they wouldn't give me medical attention and uh i had ended up snatching this officer's watch to get a supervisor i had to go through all type of crap just to get a nurse down there and the nurse came down there she was having a relationship with one of the, well, a couple of the correctional officers, which is a, a normal thing that goes on. And so the nurse kind of, she just kind of laughed it off or whatever. And uh, eventually um, I started, I bumped into this prison rights advocate named John Parati. John Parati is a well-known advocate all around the country. He's helped hundreds and hundreds of prisoners. And uh, I asked him for help, like to teach me the law and, how to file lawsuits and stuff like that. And he taught me a lot how to do lawsuits. And uh, then he got me to read um, political newspapers like Workers World and uh, the Anarchy, Anarchist Black Cross and uh, countless other publications. And uh, that's basically what lit the fire. You know, after that, uh, I got I got to reading and learning about a lot of things. It was a lot of things that I didn't know and it just, Turned on the light, a light bulb clicked on one day, and like, and then I'm living it. I'm actually living the life as well. So I just seen things from a personal perspective, like how they treat us on the inside, and and as well as on the outside. And it just, it just upset me, you know, like how how they like everything from the process of the gerrymandering process, were involved in the voting process, down to the politics of the prison industry complex and lobbyists and stuff like that. And I, it just made me so angry that uh, I just started doing something about it. I started helping prisoners file lawsuits and file, uh, seeking help from Jas- people like Jasper and the Free Ohio Movement and IWOC uh, to send complaints to the United Nations and just getting getting multiple organizations and people motivated to help prisoners and stuff like that fight back against the system because we're we're like uh we're like the voices. We can't vote, we can't fight back, you know, and we need all the help we could get. So a lot of prisoners in here don't know how to do lawsuits. They don't know how to read. They don't they don't have a lot of that lawyers don't like taking cases pro bono. So I'm, I'm I'm that guy that people come to and say, hey, can you help me with this lawsuit? Can you help me understand the law? And so I, you know, a guy helped me. So I reached out to the other prisoner and I said, well, I, I'm going to return the favor and start helping other prisoners uh, learn the law and teaching them how to defend themselves against these these uh these barbaric people, you know. Can you talk a little? I mean, so you're you're basically a jailhouse lawyer. Can you talk about some of the lawsuits that you have currently pending, and and sort of what broader issues in the prison system that these lawsuits address? Yes, uh, right now I got a lawsuit pending in uh, the U.S. District Federal Court in Toledo, Ohio, called Easley versus Zimmerman, Officer Nicholas Zimmerman, and uh, you know they've been like uh, they changed the facility. 
from a level three to a level four maximum security prison at the end of 2017. And, uh, it was, it, it just went haywire. Like, uh, uh, all the, all the, uh, Aryan brothers, they went on the yard, refused to lock, um, all the level fours, they was refusing to lock and, and how it was multiple protests and, uh, everything in this prison was in an uproar. And, uh, I was trying to find support and help from like, I, at the time I didn't know how to reach out to IWOC members and all the different organizations. The only person that I knew was the free Ohio movement, uh, Queens are here and them. So I had reached out to her and they had had a Facebook, I think they had had a Facebook thing set up and, and, uh, that's when I started hearing about Jasper and stuff. She's a, she's a, a college student and she has a lot of comrades, you know, that rides with her and, uh, they, they reached out and called the inspection committee and started, uh, uh, helping out or whatever. But since then, it's just, they locked me up. They retaliated against me. And I've been in segregation and solitary confinement for the past year and a half. I, I think October will be two years. And the only thing I went to seg- the only thing I went to segregation for was standing up for the prisoners on the yard that was complaining about is this ongoing, like they, they put us on lockdown and had locked the whole facility down. We went from five hours a day to basically extreme lockdowns. Like we was, they was only letting us out for one hour and stuff like that. Uh, dudes was arguing and fighting over the telephones. We couldn't get a shower. Simple stuff. And it, 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 and I was trying to explain to them like, like y'all, you, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta take into consideration stuff like showers, recreation, and so on and so on, or you're gonna start a whole bunch of chaos over the telephone, showers, rec, child, all this, like, and they just wasn't taking these things into consideration. And, uh, when guys started protesting and complaining, we had this vindictive warden here named, uh, Sean Coleman, I think it was. Or his, I know his name was Gordon Coleman. And, uh, Coleman is the type of person that if you know the law or you file lawsuits or you're a jailhouse lawyer or you file grievances, complaints, he will, he will target you and he will tell them to just make up the most, he will turn a, like a, when he gets you, he'll get you on a little charge and then he will try to amplify the charge. He will try to take from, from a minor offense to a major offense and justify locking you up. And that's basically what happened. They went and I was, we was on the yard. Everybody was complaining. And I, I was like, shoot, you know, I said, you know, we need to, I said, get like 300 people do, do, do like 300 hunger strikes, uh, uh, do some, uh, uh work stoppages, hunger strikes in a, uh, uh, filed like 50, 50 lawsuits. I said, I bet you that'll get their attention. I said, it's more y'all than it is them. I said, it's stress and numbers. And, uh, they basically wrote a complaint on me. I mean, wrote a, uh, disciplinary report on me and locked me up for the past two years for just speaking out. Well, no violence involved. Uh, then uh, at first they was going to let me back out. They let me back out. They came, relocked me back up when the warden found out. He was like, no, I want y'all to uh, add another charge to his ticket for uh, a riot. And we was all like, there was no riot. How can you get in with a riot charge when there was no riot? So took me to a disciplinary hearing on a suicide watch because I went on constant suicide watch. So he forced me in the hearing anyway, and they're not supposed to have hearings when you're on a suicide watch because of competency issues. And uh, when I get to the hearing, they charged me with the wrong charge. They charged me with a work stoppage. So they dismissed the charge and threw it out and still found me guilty for the lesser charge of uh, Rule 18. They're trying to say the only disturbance was that a group of young, young gang members surrounded me and they were listening to me. That was the disturbance. They was listening to what I had to say, and I was, and they trying to say I was promoting, trying to promote uh, a riot. But at the time, 
uh, due to the fact of an old lawsuit, Austin versus Wilkerson and stuff, they 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 they're not allowed to send people to Supermax security no more. Uh, Supermax is specifically made for um, the worst of the worst, people that kill people, uh, riots, uh, where there's significant property damage. Uh, someone got assaulted or hurt, like an officer got assaulted, stabbed, hurt, killings, murders, stuff like that. So when I appealed it, I used that criteria. I said, I didn't kill nobody. I said, I didn't stab nobody. I said, no one engaged in a riot. No one hurt nobody. I said, all that was said was I told these guys, you know, if, if, they're, if, you, if they're doing you wrong, stop complaining. File complaints, grievances, lawsuits, and hunger strikes. And y'all trying to tell me I'm promoting a riot. That's not the case. They're doing the same thing to another comrade in OSP, uh, Sadiq Hassan. Uh, his number is 130559. He was involved in the Lucasville riot back in 1993. He's, the, he's basically leading the movement, and he got a newspaper in the mail talking about the strike. They locked him up. It's this guy in, 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 at the ODRC headquarters named Brian Wichert. He's the enemy. Brian Wichert is is attacking any member that's associated with IWOC and Free Ohio members and stuff like that that's organizing in in the state of Ohio work stoppages, hunger strikes, you know, and and we're not we're not uh taking hostages, we're not stabbing nobody, we're not killing nobody or nothing. We're not having a we're doing what the First Amendment and the Constitution allows us to do and that's to engage and we're allowed to complain. We're allowed to file complaints. We're allowed to file lawsuits. We're allowed to go on hunger strikes. You mentioned the newspaper that Hassan got that he got um, punished for. Um, you've also been punished for like incoming information around yeah. concerning like First Amendment rights and your ability to communicate with people. Can you talk a little bit about the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement book that you received and also the like limitations on communication concerning the, the term slavery? I guess um, Columbus has has basically done put the order out on all the uh, all the leaders in the movement and stuff like that where their mission is to disrupt to disrupt the movement by by uh mailroom censorship some of their tactics is the issue out fake conduct reports disciplinary reports and try to get you put on phone restriction and and uh what they're doing they're blocking IWOC members' telephone numbers out, and they're blocking Free Ohio members' telephone numbers out the telephone where you can't call them because um, they they realize, like, the movement is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we making these calls and then the phone zaps, the phone zaps and all the media attention and stuff like that. So they're trying to find ways to cut off all communication to the outside world. Like, they got Hassan on telephone restriction for a year or so. I recently put an article in the San Francisco Bayview newspaper back in December for everybody to phone at the Correctional Institution Inspection Committee at 614-466-6649 and complain about about the, uh, them uh, putting Hassan on a year's telephone restriction and, uh, and all the censorship and stuff like that. But uh, yes, that, that is what just, just happened to me. Uh, uh, Central Ohio IWOC is in the process of doing a, um, a prison abolishment uh, study group. And uh, they're trying to send in certain books and literature and educate, doing an education, uh, uh, educational thing. Since they took college out, we don't have that. So, you know, that's how we, we got to improvise. But anytime he sends an email, Central Ohio IWOC sends an email that mentions anything about slavery or prison slavery. Uh, they censor it for no reason, and they will not tell you that they took it. And uh, I didn't even know. They took three pieces of uh, email. They took three emails from me, and they're supposed to, according to law, they can't take nothing from you without due process. They're supposed to tell you when they take something, and they're supposed to tell you why they took it, and there's supposed to be a process where you can challenge it. It's always got to be an appeal. So you, so if, if there's no appeal and there's no way to challenge it, then that gives them to the authority 
to be uh, unchecked, they could be unchecked. There, there, there's no one that can stop them, and they could say they could like what they've been doing. They've just been taking uh, they've been taking emails and letters and mails from a person just because they don't like that person, and they don't give you a reason why they took it. Now that's Toledo. Toledo prison is is the worst prison when it comes to the mail room. They're 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 heavy. Lucasville may be a little bit better, but not Toledo. Toledo will take your mail, they will take your email, they will and they won't tell you why they took it. And I only reason I've been finding out is uh Central Ohio, IROC and different people they, they give me I got them giving me their uh, their JK uh, confirmation confirmation numbers and I write and I get a JP journal printout from the mail room and I give them the confirmation numbers to check on the mail and, and they confirm that yeah this mail came in and it was took. This is Vinyl Straw Radio and I'm Bursts. You're listening to David Easley, an incarcerated activist at Toledo CI in Ohio and Jasper from the Free Ohio Movement. You can find David on Facebook and Twitter. David is starting to tell about his abuse at the hands of prison guards and staff, and David and Jasper talk a bit more coming up about prison mail censorship. For a useful and new resource with timelines of prisoner organizing and resistance in the so-called U.S., check out perilouschronicle.com. And uh, the major down here is taking the emails and the investigator Jim Hobbs has been harassing me. Uh, Jasper Jasper had called the uh, Correctional Institution Inspection Committee last year in like June or I think it was June when Officer Hughes Officer Hughes sprayed me with mace and beat me in handcuffs with another officer named Kriego. And then he told his girlfriend, the nurse uh, Nurse Peterson, to lie on her reports and say I tried to attack her to justify spraying me with the mace and beating me and he told another nurse, Lasha Johnson, lie on their reports to uh say I launched at him or tried to uh charge at him and he had to mace me and beat me to justify uh, to justify him using so much force on me. So they all lied on their reports and Jasper, she uh uh in Three Ohio they put it up on my Facebook page and uh and uh Jasper called the inspection committee and they did a phone zap. And uh, that uh, that uh, those that when all that happened, um, um, make a long story short, uh, I filed a lawsuit and that's that's what the lawsuit is about now. But um, yeah, the censorship the censorship down here is just uh, it's it's a um, it's extreme. That's only one word to put it. It's extreme censorship. I've had mailings to another comrade in OSP rejected because Mm -hmm. I wrote out a summary of like a page of prison legal news with case precedents relevant to a case he was working on. And because that information of what they're doing, uh, because that information of there have been like these five or so case precedents that were, were like rulings going back to the 90s saying an issue that he was dealing with and that would have helped him to file complaints about it because that information was included. The mailing was rejected. This is in a situation where, like David said, the prison system has already defunded and removed its like college program, its libraries. I would imagine there's like limited, if any, access to legal books. So you were basically just fulfilling the like what the state has refused to do in terms of giving people the ability to defend themselves through the legal processes that they have set up themselves, right? Right, pretty much. Like that's what we have to do in here. Like we have we have to depend on uh, people like Jasper and outside resources to send us case law off the internet sometimes and books and things of that nature because it's so hard to to uh, get access to uh, legal materials, books, and certain books and stuff like that. It just it's, it's just uh, hard to obtain in here. I, I just want to like Toledo. I'm doing research now because we don't even have paralegals in the law library. We got a librarian, and she's not a trained paralegal, and she's trying to do two jobs. She's trying to do the librarian's job and the law librarian's job. And so one day I asked her. I said I need a complaint form to the inspector general, the Ohio Inspector General's office. She writes me back. She said, are you talking about the institutional inspector? 
I said, no. I said, I'm talking about the Ohio Inspector General. He's like above the Attorney General of Ohio. And I said, they got these forms that you could pull off the website at the Ohio Inspector General's office. Each institution is supposed to have them in the law library where you can file these complaints, whether it's on abuse, uh, assaults, you know, correct, uh, corrupt, corrupt, correctional. Basically, they check the government. They're, they're a government. They check uh, corrupt government. And uh, the lady wrote me back, like, we don't have those forms, da, 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 but every, she doesn't know nothing. And I was like, are you a law, a law librarian? She said, no, I don't have no training. She said, I've been telling them to get y'all a law librarian, but they won't lis- listen to me. She said, maybe if y'all complain enough and enough of us say something that they'll get them. So I, I complained about it. I wrote it up, went to Columbus, and I got the case law, and it says a prison that holds over 1,100 inmates, they're supposed to have no less than five paralegals. This prison holds up 950, 990 prisoners, and uh, we don't have one paralegal down here, so it's bad down here. That's terrible. Well, changing gears a little bit, can you talk about uh, what you experienced, like what, during the 2018 prison strike, or during actually both the prison strikes, can you talk about how you saw, like, other prisoners engaged? Did people, um, besides your, your conversation about people refusing work or what have you, uh, how did, how did other prisoners take it and what sort of organizing did you see without naming names? Uh, like that, like I said, down in here in Toledo, it's a complex situation. Like we're trying to, uh, be more, more strategic. And what, what I'm trying to do is, is, uh, educate the prisoners first on the strike. Because a lot of them are down here, a lot of people don't know. And the younger guys, a lot of them don't know who George Jackson is. They don't know nothing about blood in my eye. They don't even know about the 13th movement. A lot of them do, some of them don't. And they don't even know who to get in contact with and how to organize. They're disorganized down here. And so part of the process, I'd be needing help, like getting literature, like baby newspapers passed out. Uh, uh, certain type of books like the new Jim Crow uh, uh, legal observer affidavits to the National Lawyers Guild stuff that I could pass around and let the prisoners read and educate them on the strike we just don't have enough of that floating around here so I've been trying to trying to find ways to improvise with what I got so when the strike when the strike approached August 21st I knew we wasn't ready you know, uh, I knew uh, we, we just wasn't ready. So what I did, I put a, a team. Uh, it's me and my other brother, he, he doesn't mind if I mention his name because he, he also uh, uh, wants to uh, speak out about the conditions in here too. He His name is Matthew Hinkston. Matt Hinkston and uh, uh, we assembled a little strike team and we put it up on Facebook. For the most part, I didn't... I didn't call. I didn't want everybody else to uh, to uh, jump out there at the moment because they wasn't ready. Like they, they, it's a lot of guys like they're they don't know what they're striking for. You know what I'm saying? I mean, some like I said, a lot of us do, some don't. And I didn't want to. So we took off the OST um, Youngstown, their whole, their whole facility was on work stoppages and hunger strikes and stuff like that. And, uh, like we all communicate with central Ohio, IWOC and Hassan, uh, was talking to one of the comrades, this, uh, friend of ours who's with the, uh, central Ohio, IWOC named Madeline and they blocked the phone line all across the state. And they won't let me or Hassan or any person in Ohio prison system call the IWOC, her IWOC line. So that was the first phone, the phone, the phone, the uh, IWOC number they blocked in the state of Ohio. So like we consistently have to like stay two steps ahead of the game. We gotta, we gotta consistently like change our phone numbers, change emails and stuff like that because of the harassment and, uh, them trying to block communication and stuff. So as the pressure got turned up, Central Ohio, Iowa, they went and actually got the the old prison director, Gary Moore's home phone number. 
and they took the, the uh, they put the uh, the prison director's phone number up on the web and told the supporters phones out to out his ass, right? So he was getting phone calls at one in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning while he was asleep. He was just frustrated and pissed off. So they had they had cut off me and the strikers uh saw, they had zapped all our phones, zapped all our email. And so we had put that out there too. And uh like I guess hundreds and hundreds of people kept calling and finally uh we wouldn't stop our hunger strike or whatever and they finally cut the phones back on. They cut the emails back on. But uh, like I said, my iWalk phone, uh, phone line was blocked. And then uh, in November, November 2nd, we went on strike again because uh, officers down here named Officer Tom Ford, P-O-U-T-A-R-D, uh, Officer Zimmerman, and uh, Cuttingham and another officer, they was they were spitting in prisoners' food, harassing us, and stuff like that. And the institution, the institution had a uh, had us in the wrong security classification. So like we all we all went to outside record and refused to come in. And uh, they got a, a like a SWAT team assembled, like a SRT team. And they they came out there with uh like these uh, long barrel rifles, and they shot us with a uh, rubber bullets and sprayed it, like shot us with rubber bullets and mace, and uh they got us back. It took us four hours to get us back. So as soon as we got back inside, I called uh, Ohio Valley IWAC. I called Jack, and we called Jasper. So Jasper, uh, I'm I'm barely breathing. I'm trying to breathe. I'm choking and stuff trying to trying to talk to her mm -hmm. she's she's asking me what's going on what's wrong so jasper i'm like they won't let us get in the shower and we got messy all on us so she called the prison like why don't y'all get them guys showers we know that y'all made them et cetera, et cetera. and they told her wait till monday it's friday you know we don't take showers on the weekend saturday and sunday so they said well they gotta wait till monday to get in the shower and made us basically sleep in the maze all weekend. And by Saturday, Jasper had uh, put it, got up to like 300, uh, 300 uh, views on Facebook and, you know, um, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, phone zaps, uh, mm -hmm. the answer to phone zaps. She put up like 300 messages. So everybody started calling the inspection committee or whatever, and then the investigator comes in on a Saturday. And then he comes in again, investigating. Then it's on. They had us on a ninety-three point five FM, and uh, then it was on the Cleveland uh, Ohio News Network, <clears throat> and they reported it like it was a major disturbance, like we was having a riot down here. Where all we did was we had a, a nonviolent sit down and refused to come inside the prison. And uh, next thing I know, November eighth, they emergency transferred me out, sent me to Supermax. And uh, then from there, they took me, took me, forced, stripped me out, made me get naked, put me on suicide watch. That was their fake mental health evaluation because I'm on the mental health caseload and I'm not supposed to be in a supermax uh, solitary confinement unit, but they got me in this solitary confinement unit anyway. I came off watch. Uh, they put me in the hole for getting shot with the rubber bullets and having to sit down. So I went back on watch after they retired, then they retaliated on another member, uh, IWAC member, uh, Keith Lamar, the state requested that they issue him a death, a death sentence. And, uh, in December they granted it and, uh, they plan on killing, uh, Keith Lamar on November 23rd of 2023. So I was just really depressed and I stopped talking for like, uh, maybe a month, a month and a half, I stopped talking and they had me on suicide watch and they said that I was uh, unresponsive after I got the news that they was going to kill Keith Lamar. I just went into a deep depression and uh, they sent me to the residential treatment unit, the mental health unit at the CRC Correctional Reception Center. But instead of putting me in the treatment unit, they put me in a crisis unit and left me there for like a month and a half. 
no TV, no property, nothing. They destroyed my TV and property at OSP, uh, destroyed my property and just left me in the hole at CRC for a month and a half. I filed a lawsuit for this mentally retarded guy up there. Then they finally got upset. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm Bursts. We're listening to David Easley, a prisoner in Ohio and member of IWOC, talking about his punishment at the hands of the Ohio Department of Corrections through and following the 2018 nationwide prison strike. Also speaking is Jasper of the Free Ohio Movement. Mm -hmm. Dear listener, if you're hearing this show for free, good. That's exactly how we want it, and that's how it's always going to be. If, however, you have a few extra bucks to spend on helping us create this weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian content, they would be much appreciated. Money is a super unfortunate construct, both made by and made more real by capitalism and class society. You can make monthly or one-time donations of any amount of these constructs, and believe me, any amount greatly helps, by following the links up at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org slash donate, at which place you can also see a bunch of shiny swag for sale including but not limited to t-shirts emblazoned with our show logo. Keep your eyes peeled for more sticker designs in the near future. Finally, thanks a million to all of those who have donated so far. Your support in this way is truly cherished and appreciated. David's about to speak about mental health care at the ODRC. I'd like to offer a trigger warning that David details his abuse at the hands of prison guards. They got upset and I was helping mentally ill prisoners file lawsuits about deliberate indifference to medical needs. So they sent me right back to Toledo. So now I'm back at Toledo. And the lawsuit I filed is an officer named Wallace, Jay Wallace, that's in the lawsuit. As soon as I got here, like two, three, about three weeks ago, on March 12th, he retaliated against me and he was talking to me at the door telling me to shut up. And I went and shut up and he had his partner curl on the side with a big fire extinguisher can of mace and they hard, tried to hurry up, pop the hat, sneak, sneak. And, uh, they sprayed me with all type of mace on my testicles and, uh, my, pe- my penis area and, uh, lied on their reports and said I had a razor in my hand that I was like to try to make it seem as if I was suicidal, but I wasn't suicidal. So when they asked me, I said, no, I'm not suicidal. They searched the cell. They couldn't find a razor or nothing. And, uh, so I filed a restraining order on them last week. And at right now, right now, as I'm talking to y'all during this interview, they just put this, this black magnet over my window so I can't see out my cell and they can't see in. And uh, they're doing this because I, uh, uh, I'm i in my cell and a, a female officer said she came by my cell and I was masturbating. So they put these magnets on our window and the fire department already said this is a safety hazard. They said because uh, it's a security risk, you can't see in the cell when it's a fire. And not on top of that, I'm a C1, seriously mentally ill prisoner. This start in December 4th, they created this new policy in the state of Ohio that's in violation of the constitutional law stating that now the state of Ohio, we are allowed to put seriously mentally ill prisoners in supermax solitary confinement for up to six months, 12 months to 24 months, as long as we let them out of their cell for two hours a day. And so that's what they're doing right now. They got all these mentally ill dudes in solitary confinement. Lucasville had six suicides in the past 18 months in solitary confinement. Uh, we had a suicide down here in July, some guy named Dane Butcher and Jasper, Jasper and all them, they got their obituaries and was advocating about all the mentally ill prisoners in solitary confinement that's committing suicide and, and they're hanging themselves, they're killing themselves. Uh, then, uh, OSP in November, they had a suicide. A guy up there named Payne Osborne just killed himself. They, they haven't learned their lesson. So David, can you, can you say like on this, on this note, can you talk about like what kind of mental health help that the prisons, cause you've been through, you've just mentioned off a couple of different prisons that you've been inside of what sort of like institutional aid is there for prisoners? Like I've, I've heard some studies before that saying like even the re, like a huge amount of people that go into prison are in because of 
like untreated mental health issues. Right. Um, and then when you go into prison and put someone in solitary confinement, it seems like it would make it worse, right? So and, what kind of treatment do they offer? Um, right here, this is what they're doing. Uh, like I told you, they just covered my window up right now. Now, now C, C1s, seriously mentally ill prisoners, they're supposed to be in what you call a residential treatment unit or a prison hospital setting or Twin Valley technically Twin Valley uh, outside mental health hospital. And the reason why we got these C1 status is these type of people are supposed to be on a constant supervision. Uh, they're supposed to be supervised by doctors, nurses, and mental health staff at all times because they're unable to function in a regular general population setting with regular prisoners. If you leave them alone for too long, anything's liable to happen, just like leaving a little five, a little three-year-old or a five-year-old around a hot stove or something. Like, they, they, they're not supposed to be unsupervised. And one time, Lucasville, they let a guy out in the general population that was crazier than the Betsy bug, and he set his teeth on fire, he set his blankets on fire, he set the whole cell on fire, and then the whole block started choking off the hit, off of the smoke. It was smoke inhalation. He almost killed at least 13 prisoners because they put him in general population and he was unsupervised. And, uh, and then there was another incident where a mentally ill guy back in 2000 and I think it was seven or eight. A uh, guy down there, he he was delusional. He was hearing voices, and he stabbed this white guy, and he killed him, and stuff like that. And uh, like uh, these people, they will let these people out into society, straight out the door, no help. They won't send them to a hospital or nothing. They'll send them to a halfway house or whatever. That and they just let them straight out the door. And the next thing you know, we've seen one of them on the news. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. There's one guy recently that just got out of here named uh, Goldsby. Goldsby got out and he followed uh, this girl all around Ohio State campus. And uh, he, it was late at night and then he, they allegedly, allegedly said he killed her and stuff like that. Like, we all knew Goldsby, he was mentally mentally deranged. Like, he's sick in the head and he needed help. But they didn't give a damn. They let him straight out, no medication, no help, nothing. They give you, like, maybe 14 days worth of pills and medication and kick you out the door. And, uh, like me, I've been in here 20 something years. My, my dad has died. Most of my family members have died. Uh, my mom, she's still alive, but some people ain't that fortunate. When they get out, they don't have nowhere to go. They don't have no family. So they go sleep under a bridge or they go to a halfway house and they reoffend, they kidnap somebody and come right back to prison. And, uh, I just, I, you know, like we're supposed to be getting therapy. We're, we're supposed to be getting, uh, programs. We're supposed to be getting retro emotive therapy programs. We're supposed to have groups, um, movies, arts, different things of that nature, medication, uh, education. Um, they say we're, we're not supposed to be in solitary confinement because solitary confinement induces the mental illness. It makes it worse. Some of these guys sit in these cells and they rock. They rot in these cells, and then they come in, and the next thing you know, they're hanging from the light post they did. You know, and uh, sad, that's what they're, they're doing. They're warehousing us. They're saying, screw this. We don't want to treat these guys, so let's let's throw it off on security and make it, to, uh, make it a behavior issue, and let's throw them straight into solitary confinement for two years. We ain't got to worry about them for two more years. That's what's going on. After the incident in November where it was a Friday night and and cops in Toledo had sent in a sent in a SWAT team, maced a bunch of people, wasn't gonna let them shower until Monday morning. I contacted Free Ohio Movement Comrades, I contacted IWAC Comrades and I organized a lot of my classmates, people I know at school, to 
call in that weekend and be phone zapping and asking why aren't you letting them decontaminate it's policy that they're supposed to decontaminate if they've been maced when it eventually they got so fed up with how many people were calling they just started saying monday morning and then hanging up but (laughs) when they've went friday saturday and they've maced people and aren't going to let them shower until monday morning they don't get peace from phone calls from college kids (laughs) and then they they eventually let them shower but like Monday after mazing them Friday. So basically they were just burning with the chemicals yeah. on their skin, having to go to sleep and wear clothing that was soaked in the Yeah, chemicals. they'd used chemical weapons on them and weren't letting people shower, weren't letting people change their clothing, weren't people um other times similar things have happened. They didn't they let didn't let people decontaminate they didn't let people move to a different cell or clean up the cell they'd been in. I don't know if that happened specifically at the incident in November, but they weren't letting people shower or change their clothing. So people who were burning with chemical weapons on their skin, like. I think that you, uh, David, you ended that very well and really wrapped up that point. Yeah. Is there like another topic while you're on the line? One of the one of the other Iowa members down here, he's a newer member. His name is uh, Christopher Chilton. He's doing work. Christopher Chilton. Uh, he's doing his number five five eight six seven three. He's doing work also. Um, he's trying to uh, use his case. He he's trying to use his case to uh, crack the ceiling on the on this on the juvenile on the Ohio's Ohio has like a uh, unconstitutional law where if you're 16, 17 years old, they're 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 doing automatic bond overs, right? And uh, he was like 16 years old, and they're, they're doing these automatic bondos. Giving like they, you know, it was a big issue about giving juvenile life without parole. Did you hear about that? Mm-hmm. Well, What's an automatic bond? Okay, over? Quick, an automatic bond over is when they they don't get a judge, no discretion. They don't they don't look at the the child's uh, his his mental intellect, his mind. They just figure, okay, he can't be rehabilitated. For example, in, in a juvenile court, they can hold you till you're 21 years old. Mm-hmm. And if you get an automatic bond over, they could just give you 99 years to life or whatever at age 15, 16, 17, or whatever. They could do it at a lower age, but they saying at 16, 17, if you catch a felony, especially a murder, they don't look at your past to see if this is uh, your first charge, uh, the circumstances of the case. They don't get a judge, no say so. They say you automatically got to send this guy to the adult penitentiary, right? And uh, well, Christopher Children, he wanted me to he wanted me to read this to y'all over the air. And uh, he said he said this right here, uh, where he's talking about it creates a presumption of guilt. On he sent his uh, his journal entry and indictment, and the number one it says the child was 14 years of age or older at the time of conduct, barged an affidavit. And uh, in his case, he was 16 years old, the date being January 27th, 1990. And this is the main thing he wants you to listen to. He said, there is a probable cause to believe that the child committed the act of murder. Now, he wasn't found guilty when they wrote this, but they wrote it. And this is what you call an entry sustaining the state of Ohio's motion to relinquish jurisdiction filed July 20th, 2006. And he said it's it's unconstitutional because it it um it is it's like giving you uh, it's putting in your mind that he's guilty before he even go before he goes to trial. And uh 15, 14, 13 year olds the judge has this, they saying they got discretion with them, but not 16 year olds and 17 year olds. And the statute states that a juvenile is anyone under the age of 18. So he's looking for any type of help 
from um, juvenile advocates, uh, the juvenile initiative groups and stuff like that that's willing to support them. You could, you could go on jpay.com and email him just as well. His name is Christopher with a K, Chilton, uh, C-H-I-L-T-O-N, his number, 558-673. And what they're looking to do is is get this amended out of the, the legislature and where they would have to bring thousands of juveniles back, back to a uh, court for resentencing and stuff like that. But yeah, as of right now, they're locking juveniles up in adult prisons. We got guys in here that are 16, 17, and 15 years old in adult prisons doing uh, life, life sentences and stuff like that at the age of 16. That's insane since, I mean, if nothing else, like the distinction for juveniles getting a different sentencing, like sentencing level than adults is because their brains literally have not stopped forming right. until they're like 21 years old, probably. Right. That's so like, even if somebody has some sort of maladjustment or whatever at a certain age, because they've suck suffered like terrible things in their life right. or because they weren't raised very well or because they're having just a really rough time. Like, how can you hold them to the same standard as you would an adult? It's it's utterly, like, dishonest in the way of putting someone who's facing a mental health crisis into a situation where they're being tried and convicted as if they were totally cogent at the time a crime was committed, right? Oh, my God. I just, I just met a white guy that was mentally retarded. He was, like, 67 years old, but he has the... The mentality, or the, they say his IQ is of a of a fifth grader, of a fifth grader. Like he 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 has a speech impediment and everything, and everybody was upset. Like how in the hell did he even make it to prison? Like he was supposed to go to a hospital, you know. And Ohio Ohio is bad on on, on that locking juveniles up and putting mentally ill prisoners in uh, solitary confinement and, 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 and stuff like that. It, 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 something has to be done to address this stuff, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's, just, it's just pitiful. Since so much of like the work that groups like, are they organizing a model around like the Free, o Free Ohio Movement or IWOC are focused on people on the outside and the inside, connecting with each other and finding com like common grounds for organizing. And because prison is something that affects such a large part of the population, in particular marginalized communities like poor folks and people of color, have you seen much of a, like you said, you've, you've talked about comrades that are involved in IWOC who have been doing organizing. You've talked about like other prisoners. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to connect with folks on the outside who are doing work and like sort of break down the walls that prison constructs? Um, well, that was a difficult one there. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of hard. And uh, like Jasper has been my backbone throughout the whole process. He's made it easy for me. But up until I met Jasper, it's been an uphill battle. Like, you know, it's hard. So I use Jasper. I use Jasper. Uh, to help me a whole lot with communication issues and stuff like that. Matter of fact, her, if anybody want to reach out to, uh, by phone, you can contact Jasper at 267-283-5758. Uh, and you can talk to her uh, or uh, speak, if you want to reach out to me, my number, my uh, name is David Easley. Spell my last name, E-A-S-L-E-Y. And my number is 306-400. And all you got to do is go to JPay, JPay.com. It's the letter J-P-A-Y.com and set up a JPay account and put me on your email contact list so you can send me email directly to me and I will answer all emails. And I have a Twitter handle at, at, at O-H for the number four prisoners and anybody that's interested in engaging with me and stuff like that they uh this this is going to be a, a official twitter page where we would be confirming strikes and stuff like that and i'm glad you asked that question because this is why we recently came up with this twitter page and um, i put uh jasper's phone number and stuff like that i'm gonna try to make it twitter 
specifically for that so we could all stay connected. Everybody could stay connected. And um, first, uh, the Bayview newspaper, Amani, Sawari, and stuff like that, so we could all stay in contact because communication has been uh, a big issue because I can't afford postage stamps there. They're, they're jacking up the prices on the postage stamp in here for 74 cents for one stamp. So I'd be needing people to send me postage stamps, but you're not allowed to send postage stamps direct. You got to go online to the United States Postal Service and order the postal stamps with a debit card and have the postal service send the stamps to me. And they got to be stamped in boss envelopes. Like we can't get regular stamps. We got to have engraved uh, and ball stamp envelopes. And that helps me where I could communicate because during the strike, I got a, maybe 50, 60 something letters and I still haven't been able to communicate with them or whatever. And uh, that's why I wanted to put it out there that it's easier and it's much cheaper for me for people to just log on to jpay.com and email me because I got over 169 email stamps on jpay. Like, that's what we e- we gotta buy stamp like email stamps to email people and stuff like that. But for the most part, uh, uh, people on the outside are having um, um, different ideas and different agendas, and people are colliding and stuff, and it's creating confusion and stuff like that. And you know, uh, money money makes it makes a uh, money is just is uh, make the situation that much worse or, you know what I'm saying? People are donating money to these large organizations and on behalf thinking they're donating it to us. But like this call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Like a lot of us haven't seen a dime of that money. Um, and like, I guess, you know, it's, it's scam artists is out there or whatever, and like I'm, like I'm, I went through it with a situation with some girl out of Texas named uh, uh, Lola Rucker. Like she was putting people on our Twitter page and wasn't telling us she was putting them on there. She was collecting donations and stuff like that, and wasn't giving people uh, none of the money that was on the Twitter. And we caught her in the middle of a scam, we got in an argument, beefing. So I got to arguing with this girl, and so like it's hard trying to find people out there that, that we could trust or whatever. But uh, me, and, me and the guys in our strike, we went on hunger strike. And, uh, like, I was starving. I didn't have no food. Like, I ain't had no money. And, like, uh, we'd be in here, like, selling clothes, selling socks, selling our shoes just to get food and stuff like that. And, you know, I was having a hard time paying for the telephone bill to call people and stuff like that. And, like I said, Jasper and uh, Chris Lido at Ohio Valley, Iowa, they've been really helpful. And like they people, they've been getting zero lines. So like when I run out of money on the phone, out of using my own money, I could call them collect. And they have money on their phone sometimes, or sometimes Jasper would put money on the phone so I could call uh, the final straw. She would put money on the phone so I could call, um, oh, uh, the Nation of Islam out of Toledo, Ohio. They were, they were awesome too during the strike. Uh, Washington Muhammad, Toledo, Ohio, uh, Moss 91, um, showed up with Black Lives Matter uh, during the national prison strike. They surrounded the prison uh, entrance with banners with my name and the, and the, and the strike, uh, uh, the rest of the guys' names that was involved in the strike. And uh, they showed up with the Toledo Blade and the WTLL News showed up and it was all on the TV network. And, we got a lot of publicity and stuff, um, thanks to uh, Washington Muhammad uh, from the Nation of Islam and Black Lives Matter and the Toledo chapter. And uh, and uh, he he asked uh, uh, Hassan said what the prisoners need to start start calling Muhammad and start doing uh, his talk, talk, start doing his call-ins with the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter and the Nation of Islam. He holds these these uh, conference calls with, with them like every Tuesday. And the phone number is 419-973-0248. That's the phone line for prisoners to call Washington Muhammad in the Nation of Islam about uh, uh, the strike and uh, uh, 
human rights conditions in these prisons and stuff. They like to talk about the prison industrial industrial complex and what they could do to defeat this this machine. Well, I'm not sure how much longer we have on this call, and you said you were going to be pretty pretty close to out of money. Yeah. Uh, David, thank you so much for making this call happen. I really appreciate it, and uh, okay. you're doing awesome work. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to let y'all go then. Bye, David. Take care. Love and solidarity. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm Bursts. You've been hearing David Easley, an incarcerated activist at Toledo CI in Ohio, active in the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. More of their work at incarceratedworkers.org. And now we'll hear Jasper from the Free Ohio Movement talk about her experiences in supporting prisoner struggles. So organizing. I got involved after a comrade from the Free Ohio Movement came and spoke at, at the university in Ohio. I attend about her work in organizing and the strike that comrade Imam Hassan was on at the time and the human rights issues and reasons for it. So I've been involved in the movement for about two years. During that time, it's been a kind of steep learning curve. Well, maybe for anyone who's thinking about getting involved in doing this sort of work, uh, whether it be to be an individual contact or an outward facing organizer, uh, do you have any resources or any suggestions of like ways to approach it? I mean, I, I also like growing up white middle class didn't have and I've been doing or organizing or whatever, like political activism for the last like 20 years. But right. uh, I've definitely had to like unlearn some bad habits and, and thought patterns. Uh, and yeah, I wonder if you have any like any suggestions for listeners. In addition to um, connecting with orgs and people who are already doing this work, and I would really recommend directly writing to prisoners when contact people they're already working with, put out someone's contact information, especially during a strike or some other thing, because getting letters from the outside does greatly improve people's safety when they're being retaliated against. And as an organizer trying to get involved, the the people who know the most about what's going on tend to actually be people directly impacted by the prison system. So if you're not coming from that background, you should be admitting what you don't know and working with people who do know that. My other big advice would be to think about your own mental health and secondary trauma greatly inhibits continuing to support the movement and continuing to do the work that's necessary for for your material needs and others. Like in the six months or so after I started writing to prisoners, I got really depressed because I learned about a lot of really horrific violence that I hadn't faced in my life and felt like organizing to stop this is necessary and it's going to be really hard and not immediate. And I had to like double down on looking to, to people I trust in the community I'm coming from for emotional support during that time. My third advice, I don't know, I see people at school getting so focused on staying in their lane that they don't talk to marginalized people at all. And I think that's stupid and greatly inhibits organizing alongside marginalized people against state violence. Like, I had a classmate tell me that she would get involved, but doesn't want to come off as a idiot upper middle class white college kid. And I'm like, okay, I too come off as an idiot upper middle class white college kid. We still need to organize and work to address the state violence if the point is to challenge state violence and not my own reputation. It seems like it requires a degree of humility. I've acquired humility and also like humility, but also actually understanding where, what you're capable of and where you're coming from. I think that excessive humility when it comes to just going along with whatever someone else says isn't great either. Like Officer, Officer Jim Hobbs, who David mentioned earlier, as somebody who was supposed to investigate um, complaints that I'd filed on David's behalf about excessive use of force in Toledo Correctional Institution and that officers had 
maced him and beat him up while he was handcuffed and on suicide watch. And then nurses had lied about why that had happened on a report. When he called, when he called me after that, he left a voicemail saying he wanted to talk to me on the phone about the case. I called him and then he said, and then he said, like, how did you get involved in an organization like this that misrepresents the criminal justice system? And that that's a quote pretty much. And like the way he talked about it, the implication was very much that as a white college kid, I should stay in my lane and stop organize stop organizing with prisoners and focus on my own social mobility was the advice that this off that this officer who's job is to suppress um, prison organizing and cover up violence by cops against David. That's the advice he gave me. And he also like, it's really messed up. White womanhood is whack. He like compared me to his daughter, who is about my age. And he, apparently he claims and who he said he wouldn't want to get in trouble by organizing with like social justice movements that support prisoners human rights. So I think that when that happened, my instinct towards humility is an instinct to assume that people who know more about this immediate situation than you do are probably right and you should just defer to them. And that's an instinct that this officer of the state was trying to exploit in order to get me to stop corresponding with David and stop filing complaints to state regulatory authorities on his behalf. But complaints, by the way, that it would not be necessary for me to file if the state of Ohio were not um, denying people access to the grievance procedure, which is completely illegal. Who gives a It's the cops doing it. Um, yeah. Like, for a while, for the last year or so in Toledo, grievances have been ex- exclusively on JPEG kiosks, which are outside of cells and means that people in solitary confinement can either not can either only file a grievance on weekends when they're out of their cells or can be denied access to filing grievances at all, right? Because if if cops know, oh, this guy, he wants to file a grievance against me for beating his friend up or for beating him up, he has to be at the JPEG kiosk to do that. All they have to do is prevent him from physically being at the JPEG kiosk, and then they can prevent people from filing grievances, which is like... It's one of the main reasons that um, get rid of the Prison Litigation Reform Act was one of the 10 strike demands last August, since under that law, if people can't file grievances, then they can't file lawsuits subsequently, usually. So what I had done wouldn't even have been necessary if the state were following their own rules. It, I filed a grievance on behalf of somebody who was being denied access to the grievance procedure, and I got Phone calls designed to both freak me out and appeal to like privilege and the sense of humility that you expe- that you sort of develop with it of like the implicit message being with your privilege, you don't actually know what's going on. Therefore, you should let the state continue committing violence because the state knows more than you do. And at the point of privilege recognition is to make us better at solidarity. And I think that it's important to recognize privilege and to think about how does recognizing this make me better or worse at standing up for my marginalized comrades no it was very i think it was a very good thing for for people Hmm. to hear so other outside supporter advice connect with other people who are in contact with prisoners in the same institution insofar as when there's big stuff happening environmental concerns about pollution the majority of people incarcerated in ohio they um, are aware that there's pretty bad water pollution in Warren and Lebanon facilities. Like the water isn't clear and so the correctional officers drink bottled water, but prisoners don't. To contact other outside supporters and people with incarcerated family members when possible, because getting information out like there's a strike going to happen or There's a serious environmental health issue that poses risks to a lot of people in this facility is something that should happen. And anybody getting that information out, the faster it spreads to other people who also care about prisoners in that facility, the better. My phone number is 267-283-5758. If you want to text me, 
including about like advice about immediate material questions. What do I do if I get logged out of JPay? <laughs> like I can't log in. It keeps saying my account's deleted. That's something that has happened to other outside organizers too. Same with phones getting blocked. And that talking to comrades can help us find alternatives and ways to work around. Jasper, thank you so much for having this conversation. Thanks for having us on the radio, Burst. Good luck to you and the rest of uh, and the rest of Final Straw Radio. This is the Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat underground and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.